In this Blender video, I'm going to demonstrate how to make liquid follow a path, then gather together into a sphere shape, and then fall into a pan. For this video, I'll be using Blender version 2.83.3. Let's start by adding a mesh sphere. The sphere is going to be the source of the liquid. We're going to be setting up the liquid simulation using Quick Effects. But before we do this, save your project so that Blender will save the liquid simulation cache files in the same directory as your project. Next, from the object menu, select Quick Effects and then Quick Liquid. This sets up a liquid simulation for us using the sphere as the liquid source. You'll notice that it also puts us in wireframe view. The cuboid that was added is called the liquid domain and it will contain all of the fluid. If I click the play button, you can see what we have so far. Now select the sphere and scale it down in size by pressing S, then point two, then enter. Next, we need to create a curve that we'll use as a path for this sphere to follow. There are a number of ways to create interesting curves. I'm going to use the B-Tracer add-on to trace a simplified sphere. So add another mesh sphere. Then expand the last operation panel and change the number of rings to four to simplify it. Next, we'll enable the B-Tracer add-on. So from the edit menu, select preferences and then switch to add-ons. Make sure all is selected and then type BT in the search box. Then add a check mark next to add curve B tracer to enable it. To use the B tracer add-on, press N to open the sidebar and switch to the Create tab. Now open the B tracer section. For the tool, select Object Trace, which will trace our simplified sphere with a curve. Then click the Run button. Now we have a curve that can be followed. I'm going to press N to close the sidebar. Next, select the small sphere. We're going to make it follow the curve. So switch to the Object Constraint tab and add a Follow Path constraint. For the target, select the curve that we made with B-Tracer. Then click the Animate Path button. When I press play, you can see the sphere follow the path. To set the number of frames that will be used, select the curve, switch to the Object Data tab, and open the Path Animation section. This value sets the number of frames. If I set this value to 200, you can see that the sphere follows the path for 200 frames. I'm going to set it back to 100. We don't want the curve to be visible during the rendered animation, so let's hide it. So click the Filter drop-down menu and enable the button that looks like a camera. Now click the Viewport and Render buttons to hide the curve from the viewport and the final render. Next, let's set up the small sphere to be our liquid source, so select it. Then switch to the Physics tab. To make the liquid flow out from our sphere into the liquid domain, change the flow behavior to inflow. We want the liquid to flow in very slowly so that it will look like it's floating in space. So add a check mark next to initial velocity and set the source to 0.01. .01. This will still give a small movement so that it will look like a liquid instead of a solid. Next, we're going to turn the flow off after the sphere finishes moving. So set the frame number to 101. Now we're going to add a keyframe to the use flow check mark. An easy way to add a keyframe is to click the animate property button. Now set the frame number to 102. This is where we'll turn the flow off. So remove the check mark and add a keyframe. Now let's hide the small sphere by clicking the viewport and render buttons. Next we'll set up the liquid domain. So select it and scale it down in size on the Z axis by pressing S, then Z, then 0.5, then enter. Then move it up on the Z axis by pressing G, then Z, then 0.8, then enter. To prevent the liquid from falling down until later in the animation, set the time scale to 0.01. .01. The reason that I'm changing the time scale value instead of the gravity setting is because I can't add keyframes to gravity. However, I can add keyframes to the time scale, which is what I'm going to do now. So set the frame number to 140. Then add a keyframe to the time scale. Now set the frame number to 141. 
then set the time scale to 1 and add a keyframe. Now when the animation reaches frame 141, the liquid will fall. Next, scroll down to the mesh section and add a check mark so that the liquid will be a mesh. In the cache section, change the type to final and then change the frame end value to 270. This is where the liquid simulation will end. It will also be the end of the animation, so change the end value to 270 as well. Now click the Bake All button. I'll pause the video until it's done. It's done baking. Now I'll switch to Solid View and play the animation so that you can see what we have so far. The liquid follows the curve, and then at frame 141, it falls. The next thing that we're going to do is to pull the liquid together into a sphere shape. So add a harmonic force field. Then move it up by pressing G, then Z, then 2, then Enter. We're going to set the force field to only be active between frames 140 and 201. So set the frame number to 140. Then set the strength to 0 and add a keyframe. Now set the frame number to 141. Then set the strength to 5 and add a keyframe. Next, set the frame number to 200. Then while the strength is still set to 5, add a keyframe. Now set the frame number to 201. Then set the strength to 0 and add a keyframe. Now at frame 141, the force field will pull the liquid together into a sphere shape. At frame 201, the liquid will be released and it will fall. Next, we need to bake it again. So select the liquid domain, click the Free All button, and then click the Bake All button. I'll pause the video until it's done. It's done baking, and so I'll play the animation. The liquid follows the curve, and then it's pulled together into a sphere shape, and then it falls. For the final rendered animation, I added a simple pan for the liquid to fall into. The material for the liquid was automatically set up for us when we use Quick Effects Quick Liquid. For the background, I'm using an HDR image from HDRI Haven, which is also being used to light the scene. I'll put a link to it in the video description. I also added a shadow catcher under the pan. If you don't know how to use an HDR image or a shadow catcher, then you can watch my video on that topic. I'll also leave a link to it in the video description. The only thing left that I wanted to show you is how to use the denoise node to greatly reduce the noise in the final render when using the Cycles Render Engine. So switch to the compositing workspace and add a check mark next to Use Nodes. Now press Shift A and select Filter, and then Denoise. Drop it on the image connection. This alone will improve the noise, but we can make it better by using these two other inputs. You'll notice that the Render Layers node only has these three outputs. But if you switch to the Cycles Render Engine, then switch to the Layer tab, and then add a check mark next to Denoising Data, you'll see that we now have a lot more outputs to use. So now, Connect the denoising normal output to the normal input, and connect the denoising albedo output to the albedo input. You can use the noisy image output in place of the image output, but I've had cases where the noisy image output didn't work as well. So I like using the image output. This is the image rendered with the Cycles Render Engine using 32 render samples. No denoising was used. This is the same image using the denoising setup that I just showed you. The difference is especially noticeable in the shadow areas of the pan. This is the final rendered animation using the Cycles Render Engine with 32 render samples and denoising. If you don't know how to render an animation, then you can watch my video on the topic. I'll put a link to it in the video description. Well, that concludes this video. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe and leave a comment.